If you're looking to get your questions answered on fluoride and drinking water, you're in the right place because today we're joined by Dr. Paul Conant, who's a graduate of Cambridge University and has a PhD in chemistry from Dartmouth. He wrote the book called The Case Against Fluoride and is a co-founder of the Fluoride Action Network. He's extremely passionate about this topic and it comes through in the interview. He shares a lot of statistics and data about potential health effects and if there's an acceptable limit of fluoride in drinking water based on scientific studies. And he also talks about some of the political back dealings, which I found quite shocking as they look for the truth about why fluoride is getting added to our drinking water. It was one of my favorite interviews that I've done, and I think that you're really going to enjoy it. Welcome back to the Freshness Info Series. I'm Eric Ritland, and today we are joined by Dr. Paul Conant, and we're aiming to answer the central question that most people have around fluoride, which is, is exposure from artificially fluoridated water posing a neurotoxic risk to at least some people. And of course, this topic affects two thirds of the U.S. population directly. So it's a it's a big debate and a relevant discussion. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Paul. It's a pleasure, Eric. Happy to be on your program. Your career has always been strictly focused on the fluoride debate. So maybe before we dive into the information, can you share just how you got drawn into this discussion? Well, <laughs> my career has been scientifically based and largely in teaching. I've taught at all levels, high school, technical college, university. And before fluoride, I was heavily involved in waste management. That's when I became a scientist activist. I've been an activist on several issues, which I won't go into, but as a scientist, I became an activist when they tried to build an incinerator near where I lived in Northern New York, in St. Lawrence County, New York, which borders Canada. And I got involved with that debate because I found out that when you burn trash, you produce dioxins, a very, very toxic substances. So I began to fight incineration locally and when People fighting incinerators around the United States and later around the world heard that there was an expert, quote, expert, who knew something about the issue. I became very popular in terms of speaking engagements and so on. Anyway, that's a long story. That started in 1985. And uh, I applied everything I knew about chemistry and biochemistry and later toxicology to this notion of dioxin, published several papers on it. And I was well into that when in 1996, my wife uh, put some papers on my desk. It was July 1st, I think. Uh, and she said, dear, would you look at these papers? I said, what is it? And she said, fluoridation. I said, take that away. <laughs> these people are crazy. And I did not want another issue because I was teaching chemistry at a university, very heavily engaged in that. And also, working on waste management, arguing against incineration, which ultimately has taken me to 69 different countries, incidentally. So first a scientist, then an activist, first on waste. And then when I did finally get down to read what my wife has, had given me, I was absolutely shocked, um, by which time my speciality at St. Lawrence University, started with biochemistry, but I switched to environmental chemistry and toxicology because of that involvement with dioxin and environmental impacts and so, and so on. So I took the same skills that I'd taken to um, educate the public on the dangers of trash incineration and the stupidity of incineration because it's not the way to go. Certainly in the 21st century, you should not be spending a fortune destroying finite resources, as well as poisoning people, as well as leaving yourself with an ash that nobody <laughs> wanted. I took those same scientific principles and same activist approach to wanting to educate the public and applied it to fluoride. And to my dismay, many environmentalists who had listened to me carefully on dioxin and incineration, didn't want to know about fluoridation because the government was telling them that fluoridation was safe, safe and effective, safe and effective. Um, I've got to think that the CDC was paid a, um, like a premium on every time they could get the word safe and effective, safe and effective out there on the medium. So authority backed 
fluoridation in a nutshell, authority backed fluoridation. And that authority was worked in two ways. One was to say, all the science is on our side. All the scientific studies show it's safe and effective. And it, the other way it worked was to say the people opposed to fluoridation are crazy people, flat earthers, and they're nitwits, crazy people. Well, you could imagine what that did to me, Eric, as a professor of chemistry, earning a living teaching chemistry, to be told that I was essentially a flat earth society. But what had happened, what, what had happened essentially is that or at least what I thought had happened, I thought that the opponents of fluoridation had confused the element fluorine, which, as you probably know, is the most reactive element in the periodic table. It reacts with everything, including asbestos. And if you put that in the water, it would have killed people left, right, and center. But with fluoride, harmless fluoride, from a chemist, a harmless fluoride, that's like comparing chlorine the gas, reactive gas used in World War I to poison people with common salt, sodium chloride. Um, fluoride is what fluorine becomes after it's reacted with another element. And as far as the chemist is, oh, now it's okay. It's become fluoride. It's got its extra electron. It's become a fluoride ion, F minus. It's okay. Like chloride iron, we could, we, we, it doesn't have any effect on human beings. But then when I started to read, especially what my wife had given me, I realized that um, fluoride, whilst it's not very reactive from a chemical point of view, from a professor of chemistry's point of view, it's not a nasty substance. But from a biological point of view, it's a disaster. It's very interreacts inter with very, very basic biochemical systems. It reacts, it, it, it forms complexes with metals that we need like calcium and magnesium and copper and zinc. So it has the potential to mess up a lot of important processes in biochemistry. And it can form hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bombs, bonds are the, 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 the Velcro strip in biochemistry, they, they give the structure to proteins and nucleic acids, and they, they are weak bonds, but they can easily be open and broken. So they're absolutely ideal for biochemistry, where you want to have chemical reactions without high temperatures, without changing atmospheric pressure. It, it really is the, um, is the picnic for catalytic activity, for enzymes to have hydrogen bonds. But fluoride interferes with those. So right from the get-go, you have us doing something which I think is absolutely stupid, putting a known toxic substance into the drinking water, which is known to interfere with basic biochemistry, and hope that throwing this spanner into a Rolls-Royce engine is gonna improve performance. And all of this, to add to the stupidity, when we later find out, and now the Center of Disease Control in all its glory agrees that the major benefit of fluoride, if it exists, is topical. It reacts with the outside of the tooth, outside the enamel, outside the tooth. You don't have to swallow fluoride to have any benefit. If you want fluoride, you just brush it on with toothpaste, fluoride, and then spit it out and don't swallow it. Don't swallow it. And that's what, if you look at a tube of fluoridated toothpaste, that's what it says on the back. Don't swallow. Keep out of the reach of children under six. Um, incredible. So not, one, from a biochemical point of view, it looks like a disaster waiting to happen. And from an efficacy point of view, it's, it's nonsense. You don't need to swallow it. You don't need to put it in everyone's drinking water. You no need to take all these risks. But the people in power said it's safe and effective, safe and effective. And the people opposed to it were labeled as crazy people. And unfortunately, the big villain in all this is the mainstream media that hasn't uh, ever given the people, the public, both sides of the, the arguments. And today, that has become extremely serious. Let me tell you two very important pieces of biochemistry, physiology, if you like. Number one, mother's milk protects the baby from fluoride. In other words, a mother that baby, a bottle, a 
breastfeeds her baby is protecting the baby from fluoride because there's very little fluoride in mother's milk. There's no harm to the baby from mother's milk. Um, there's very little fluoride in it, as you would expect. You wouldn't expect nature to, uh, to harm the baby with, the, with its first meal, number one. Number, that's the good news. The bad news is the placenta does not protect the fetus. From day one, the fetus is exposed to this toxic substance that can interfere with basic biochemistry. So from day one, if a mother, pregnant woman, is drinking fluoridated water, that fluoride goes uninterrupted in to the baby, and because the blood-brain barrier is not developed till about six months of age, it's straight into the brain. And so that is the gamble that we're taking every day in the United States. The whole population, including all our babies, infants, and fetuses are being exposed to this toxic substances, and now we know it's going into the brain. And if that was not enough, in 2017, the first studies emerged high quality studies, first from Mexico and then from Canada, which indicated that a pregnant woman exposed to fluoridated water or similar levels, similar exposure levels, there's a strong relationship between her exposure as measured in her urine when she was pregnant and lowered IQ in her offspring. The more fluoride the baby gets, the lower the IQ. That was what the studies came out in 2017 and 2019. And the most reprehensible thing that's happened since then is the government agencies that finance those studies. Those studies were published, financed by the NIH, but they have never warned pregnant women or parents who bottle feed their babies, infants with fluoridated tap water, avoid fluoride during pregnancy and don't use fluoridated tap water to feed your infants. They've never warned them. There's never there's not one inkling of warning that that was a problem for pregnant women in this country. So 2000, it's six years now that pregnant women should have been warned and they haven't been warned. Um, the second thing is that the New York Times and the other splendid, absolute disasters when it comes to public health uh, in this country have not reported these studies. They did not report the Mexican study. They did not report the Canadian studies. And these are high quality studies done by the best researchers in the field. And so now the, the top researchers in neurochemistry are aghast they are saying that fluoride is the new lead. The impact of fluoride at the levels at which we are exposing our babies is on akin to the effect of lead, uh, which was, as you know, banned from gasoline and paint years ago. So these are incredible stories. But there is two pieces of very good news, which is changing the story um, dramatically. In 2016, the group that I helped to fund, found, sorry, the Fluoride Action Network, we have science-based, not-for-profit organization. We did two things in 2016. One, we went to the National Toxicology Program that does the best toxicology in the United States and, and for the leading federal agencies and said, please look at fluoride's neurotoxicity, because all these studies are coming out of India and China and Mexico and Iran, which indicates a lowered IQ in children exposed to naturally natural levels of fluoride in these countries. And the second thing that we did in 2016 is we petitioned the EPA under a law called TOSCA, Toxic Substances and Control Act, under a provision in that law, individuals and non-profit organizations like ourselves could petition the EPA to ban a specific chemical substance for, of a specific use. So, sorry, you could petition the EPA to ban a specific use of a toxic substance, either in commerce or in this case in public health, if it presented an unreasonable risk to either the whole population or even a subset 
of the whole population. And of course, we said it's posing an unacceptable risk to infants, young children. Now, this is uh, okay, just before I go to segue off that for a second. This was in 2016. This is actually before those critical NIH funded studies from Mexico and Canada had come out. And so we got a, a, a double bonus, if you like. We, we, we petitioned under the existing science from China, India, Iran, and Mexico. And then we got this top-notch science from Canada and, and, and um, Mexico, which showed that we had a very, very strong case. That came out in 2017. Well, back to 2016, the EPA rejected our petition on scientific grounds. They argued that the, the, or the 300 or so scientific studies, animal and human studies that we produced, <clears throat> didn't pass muster as far as they're concerned. Not that they knew much about uh, neurotoxicity or anything about fluoride, to be honest, but they rejected our petition. But that allowed us to go to federal court and then take out a lawsuit against EPA to force them to, uh, to ban this substance. And fortunately for us, the federal law uh, court took up our case and it was eventually held, our case was held by that time by Zoom because of COVID. It was held in two, June of 2020. It went on for two weeks and it was watched by about 500 people. And my son, who was the lawyer, the lead lawyer, did a wonderful job. And we almost won that suit, but the judge held off. He said, I want to hear from the National Toxicology Program in their systematic review. And that's almost where we are at the moment. We have been waiting and waiting, waiting for Godot, this natural, national toxicology program review. Yeah, this is the best agency in the world to do reviews of toxicology. It's a federal program. It serves the FDA, the CDC, the NIH. But we're waiting, we're waiting. And anyway, what happened is that, um, to cut a long story short, in 2022, after several reviews, several peer reviews and whatnot, the NTP decided that they were ready to publish their final report. This was May, it was going to be published May 12th of 2022. We're all waiting, and all of a sudden, it doesn't come out. And what do we find out? What we found out was the pro-fluoridation forces in government, in the Center of Disease Control, the National Institute for Dental and Cranial Research, which is a big lobby for fluoride, the ADA, the professional, you know, the body, professional body, actually it's more like a trade association. All these agencies and bodies applied pressure and the eventual result of that political pressure was the deputy administrator of the NIH, the number two of the National Institute of Health that runs the whole health apparatus in the United States, forbid the, NT, the NTP from publishing that report. So you can tell, you know what was in it. You know it vindicated our position. We knew it vindicated our position. And since May of 2022, we've done several things. First of all, my son did a lot of FOIA requests to get behind the scenes emails from, from government officials, ADA people, um, you name it, NIDCR people. And we have revealed all kinds of political shenanigans going on. It's, it's unbelievable, Eric. You would think that we were talking about protecting the, the nuclear power or the missile program or, or the, the Pentagon or something, that, the, that this is what it was. No, what we're talking about is the forces that have arranged themselves to protect this stupid practice of deliberately adding a toxic substance to the drinking water to protect teeth and it only amounts to one cavity in a lifetime it's the best they can do the best study um is one 
uh, filling in a lifetime. And yet it has so much power. And if this lobby has so much power and influence that it can put political pressure on the NIH to forbid the release of what was a scientific analysis of all the human and animal studies on fluoride's neurotoxicity. Their earlier reports, their draft reports said it is a presumed neurotoxic hazard for children. Imagine if that went public. This is this prime body saying to the public, to the scientific community, this substance is a presumed neurotoxic hazard for children. And they had studies which showed that its effect occurred at the very levels at which children are exposed in the United States. My God, that would have been the end, right? That would have been the end. Scientifically, we had won. But as I've told you, we now know that behind the scenes, the political screws were applied and it was not published. However, <laughs> back to the lawsuit. The lawsuit, the judge has now required that this report, the May 12th report that was due and was signed off, the top people, NTP signed off, that's it, we finished. Here's the final report, squelched by uh, the deputy administrator of the NIH. Um, that's now available. It was fine, the judge finally forced that to be published on the website of the NTP, and the judge has agreed that we'll have a second, if you like, mini trial, a second mini trial, and that mini trial we based upon that draft report from May of 2022, or whatever it becomes in the next few months. Um, meanwhile, the Board of Scientific Counselors of the NTP have signed off on the report. They've made a few word changes, et cetera, but have agreed that the NTP report is finalized. And so the NTP said it within a few weeks, a few months, this will be out. And so the judges said, we will have a mini trial based upon this report. Any other studies that have been published since our trial of 2020, and there are one or two, uh, strong ones in our favor, and one or two that are not. Um, and we'll have expert testimony again from both sides. And that court case will take place on January the 29th of next year. And we're all bracing ourselves for that. We've raised money for, to pay our experts to go through another round. And I'm extremely optimistic, unless there's another um, political uh, craziness, uh, which which nobles the judge or does something. We don't, we don't know what to expect now. I mean, I to, Eric, if you want to learn about the way this country functions, just follow the history of fluoridation. It is such an eye opener. For me, I was pretty naive on much to do with, with politics. I mean, I fought my battles. Um, Vietnam peace movement, Biafra, Bangladesh, and so on. So I've, I've had my political awareness erased on political fronts, but I never, ever expected to see this kind of politics operating in agencies that have been set up to protect our health, for God's sake, protect our environment and protect our health, and to see them being nobbled by ignorant dentists and a dental lobby that knows as much about fluoridation's neurotoxicity as I know about a bicycle shop, to be honest. Um, it, it's just disheartening. It's disheartening. I mean, and well, I think as a, I think we've seen similar things now with, with COVID and the vaccination program and the tremendous lack of credibility on behalf of agencies set up to protect our health. And it's probably why we're seeing a lot more interest, at least on the internet now, on the battle against fluoridation, because many people had their eyes opened on the 
uh, the um, fallibility and lack of credibility of the Center of Disease Control and other major public health agencies in this country that they're prepared to listen to critics and scientists like myself. They're not prepared to have us dismissed as a bunch of crazies. <laughs> Anyway, Eric, you're probably wanting to ask a second question. That that's incredible background color, and I appreciate it. And one of the things that I was looking at as I was going through a lot of these studies and some of the history behind it, which you're right, it's it's a dizzying um, assortment of different factions and data. But I mean, at this point, there's such a broad body of data and facts and statistics, essentially showing that at least to some people, at least to the highest risk population, that nearly, I believe it was like in, and I'd like to get your opinion on this as far as specific dosing and dose studies because, and, and the acceptable, acceptable limit of fluoride in drinking water. But one of the things that jumped out to me, and I'll just read this off, but there was a working group that took the data from one of these studies and incorrectly interpreted uh, a 0.46 standard mean deviation in this NTP report to mean that, that they took the 0.46 standard mean difference to mean that this reduces IQ by 0.46, so less than half of one IQ point is what they argued. And then I believe it was you or someone from your organization pointed this out that this because it's a standard deviation on the count on the, the IQ scale with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, that that actually equates to essentially a seven point IQ difference, which is a huge difference. And that that's the difference between someone being classified as, you know, intelligent, very smart to being the opposite, you know, that's a. And then when it was pointed out to them, they essentially just shrugged it off and said, that's not really even a big deal, you know? And it, but just the, the notion that this interpretation at first blush, they, it wasn't even interpreted correctly. Like the difference between a standard deviation and a point is, it's crazy. Yeah, what, you're correct in saying I was the one that pointed this out to the Board of Scientific Counselors of the NTP. And quite frankly, I was very, very surprised that they should make that mistake because that first mistake was first made in 2012. 2012, when there was this meta-analysis of all the IQ studies done at that time by a team from Harvard, including Philip Grandjean, and uh, Anna Choi from China, they did this meta-analysis and they looked at these 27 studies that they had and 26 of them showed a lowering of IQ and the average lowering was seven IQ points, which is staggering. Now they, they found problems with some of the methodologies and said so, but the consistency of the results was remarkable. Consistency, 26 out of 27 studies. And as you pointed out, a drop of seven IQ points on a population basis, as opposed to an individual basis, on a population basis is hugely significant because we know, and this is, this is, if you like, a mathematical certainty. If you were to shift the population of uh, IQ of a population down by five IQ points across the whole population, you would do three things. One would not be noticeable. The average person would have, have a lowering of five IQ points. So you go from 100 to 95. A parent wouldn't notice that in a child uh, or a sibling or a, a, a school teacher wouldn't notice that change in two kids in a, a classroom. However, it's the two wings of the normal distribution curve, the same so-called bell curve, which are important. If you shift over five IQ points, the number of children with an IQ above 130, that means superior intelligence, very bright, geniuses even, you would halve those number of children. You'd halve the number of geniuses in your society. That's quite a significant thing to do. And even worse, down at the other end, 
But the fraction of children with an IQ of 70, uh, less than 70, you would increase that by about 60%. These are children that uh, require institutional care and, and so on. So these two changes at both ends of the spectrum of the human population are hugely significant. But very quickly, the opponents of fluoridation in 2012, we're talking about now, say, oh, no, no, look here. It says 0 0.46, 0 0.46 of an IQ point. As you said rightly and analyzed it, it wasn't 0.46 of an IQ point drop. It was 0.46 of a standard deviation, 0.46 of 15, which is seven IQ points. And in New Zealand in particular, uh, they did an outrageous thing. You had these very prominent scientists who produced this report, which was used to justify introducing, believe it or not, mandatory fluoridation in New Zealand in, in a few years ago. They used the scientific report and they, they made the same mistake. And we pointed out that they had made this mistake. This was in 2016. So they had four years to find out about that mistake. They made it. We immediately, opponents of fluoridation in New Zealand, corrected it. And what they did is that they had a sentence which says the drop of half an IQ point has no practical significance or worse to that effect. So when the mistake was pointed out to them, they just changed two words. They said this drop of half a standard deviation assuming that people in the general public knew what a standard deviation was, was is of no practical significance. So they pretended to correct the mistake. Now they're correct. It was half a standard deviation. But what they didn't say was, which is equal to seven IQ points, which is terribly significant as far as the population is concerned. They continued with the same end of the sentence. So what you're looking at there, Eric, in my view, is not a genuine scientific mistake. You're now looking at political fraud, a political fraud. Either two prominent scientists, uh, Sir Glickman, his name was, he was the chief scientific advisor to the prime minister on the one hand, and Sir David Skegg, who was head of the Royal Institute in New Zealand. These guys were protecting their rear ends by trying to conceal this mistake, or, they were so wedded or so subservient to the people that were determined to introduce mandatory fluoridation in New Zealand that they went along with this pretending not to know that they hadn't really corrected that mistake and they were deceiving the public. So 2012, it was made, it was corrected. 2016, it's made again and corrected again. And then in 2023, the Board of Scientific Councils did the same thing. Um, and we quickly corrected it and they listened and they they changed it. But I, I, I disagree with you. I, I think it was, um, they didn't, they didn't, really sort of mea culpa. They, they just admitted that they'd made a mistake, but they didn't go the whole hog and say, oh, by the way, we're awfully sorry about that because that, that analysis is seriously different now. With that mistake corrected, we're talking about a very large uh, IQ difference. But the good news is that as far as we, can, we know, the Board of Scientific Counselors has essentially said, NTP, go ahead and publish that report. This kind of leads into what is the safe, if, if there is a safe level of fluoride, and I and you kind of touched on this with one of the studies you mentioned about the linear relationship between, um, I believe it was in pregnant women, the linear relationship with fluoride intake and yeah. um, impact on IQ. And I think that there might be one other benchmark dose study that yes. that is similar and of course that we, we the EPA currently has 
a limit of four milligrams per liter of fluoride in drinking water. They're both their maximum contaminant level and maximum contaminant level goal. And I believe that was set in 1986. And um, But to, to your point earlier too, this was based on an endpoint of skeletal fluorosis. Not yeah, more, it wasn't, it wasn't, Eric, it's so nice to be interviewed by somebody who's done their homework. You're absolutely right. 1986, the EPA established a so-called safe drinking water standard, otherwise called a maximum contaminant level of four parts per million. And that's a federally enforceable standard. You cannot add water or allow people to drink water above four parts per million fluoride. And that was based not on skeletal fluoride, crippling skeletal fluoride. They didn't base it on the first symptoms of skeletal fluorosis, which are like arthritis, uh, um, stiffness and pains in the joints. They set the, the, um, the endpoint, the, so, the so-called safe endpoint, as crippling skeletal fluoride, when people have had so much fluoride in their bones that they're bent over, their backbone is practically uh, fused. Um, ridiculous. I mean, that was ridiculous in itself. Again, politics operating big time in 1986. And, and that's still the standard today. And whilst, well, you know, the, max, the maximum contaminant level is the enforceable standard. That's how much you people cannot, you cannot, um, you have to remove above that level. This is what it means to a regulatory agency. Above four parts per million, you have to remove the fluoride. But what was particularly outrageous with that um, 1986 standard was so set the MCL, the maximum contaminant level guideline, which is meant to be what does the best science say is protective of health with an adequate margin of safety, protect the most vulnerable uh, person in society. And that should have been set way, way low. And that's not an enforceable standard. That's saying, look, this is what we would like it to be. This is our ideal. And they set that at four parts per million, which is atrocious. I mean, bad science, bad science, bad regulations, badly serving the American public, badly serving the Constitution, where these officials are meant there are to uphold. Their oath is to protect the public health to protect the health and the environment. That's what they're supposed to do. And they're paid handsomely to do that. In, in 2006, there was a major, major turning point, or should have been. And that's when the EPA asked the National Research Council to review its standards, to review those four parts per million standards. And the NRC, for once appointed a balanced panel. They had three scientists who were opposed to fluoridation, three that were for fluoridation and six who were not committed. They spent three years reviewing the toxicology and produced a 500 page report, which was essentially the textbook on the toxicology of fluoride as of 2006. It was unbiased and uh, pointed out that the four parts per million standard was not safe and the EPA should set a new standard. That was 2006. What's the year? 2023? Is that 17 years later? And the EPA has done nothing, nothing to set a new standard? What the hell is going on? The EPA spent a fortune of taxpayers' money to have their standards reviewed by the premium non-scientific, non-governmental um, body in the country, the National Research Council. They spent three years doing it. They come back and said, you should uh, revisit this. You should set a new standard. This is not, not safe. And here they are still arguing for their four parts per million standard, even though we've got neurotoxicity studies showing that fluoride is lowering the IQ of children, people drinking fluoridated water, pregnant women drinking fluoridated water, babies drinking fluoridated 
tap water, formula made up with fluoridated tap water, lowered IQ, best science conducted to date. Now, uh, you said something else. You said there's been some benchmark dose analysis. Yes. Let me explain. A benchmark dose analysis is a it's the best form of risk assessment when you have um you have a dose response data when you've got data which shows a trend a linear trend over a dose range then you can do what is called a benchmark dose analysis which is essentially for the mathematicians is linear dose extrapolation you 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 just linear extrapolation whatever you just do the best straight line fix and see where it crosses the axis of your choice. Now, the benchmark that's been taken by the study that you referred to, which is the Grand Jean study from 2022, the benchmark, you want to know at what dose you get a lowering of IQ in the dose response relationship. And this was from the Mexican study from and, and the Canadian studies from 2017, 2019. And it crossed the loss of one IQ point, uh, endpoint, the benchmark uh, effect at 0.2 parts per million fluoride in the water. So pregnant women who had 0.2 parts per million of fluoride in their urine, which is more or less the same as their, the level that they would have been getting in their water or equivalent exposure. Um, that's where you get a lowering of IQ of one point. Now, if you extrapolate that to the whole population, drinking water at 0 0.7, 0 0.7 um, uh, divided by 0 0.2 is 3.5. And that, so linear extrapolation, if if 0.2 lowers the IQ by one IQ point, then uh, 0.7 would lower the IQ by 3.5 IQ points. That's linear extrapolation. That's incredible. That's incredible. You're getting very close to that level, which would halve the number of geniuses in your society. Mm -hmm. So that's where the best science and the best, uh, the, the benchmark dose analysis is the preferred methodology as far as the EPA is concerned. This is what they are supposed to do. Not that they've got very close to doing it. They're still defending uh, four parts per million as being safe. It's incredible. Four parts and per million. Just to be clear, you, and, and what's crazy about that is when you're saying the 0.7, that, the, that's the targeted fluoridation level yes yes based yeah. on dental fluorosis this isn't even the maximum contaminant level that's four milligrams per yeah, unit yeah. this is the exactly. targeted level and so when you say 0.7 that a lot of these studies are showing whether it's 0.2 or 0.15 or which yes. that would be another data point but yeah, yeah. it's it's hey, basically, hey, basically it's you would say that multiples higher than that yeah yeah, yeah it's uh, the average for the average person based upon this analysis assuming everything's ever average average to some is 3.5 iq points but some children will be getting much more than 0.7 some children will be getting 1.5 two parts per million if you look at their total dose of fluoride from toothpaste from water and everything else so 3.5 would be less than conservative as far as protecting the children of the United, United States. So when you talk about 0.2 parts per million, basically what you're saying is there's no safe level. We are where we were with lead in the early 2000s when scientists were saying, like Ellen Silvergeld at the Environmental Defense Fund, she was saying there is no safe level of lead as far as impacting children's intelligence is concerned. And it's only a function of how good your studies, how well your studies are designed as to what the level of fluoride you're gonna have, or lead, you're gonna see an effect. And that's what we're finding with, with, um, with the fluoride studies. The best studies done to date, the lowest level was 0.2, but it could be lower than that. that they didn't find a threshold. And that, incidentally, is what the NTP said 
in their systematic analysis. We see no evidence of a threshold. We see no evidence of a safe level. Now think about that for a moment. We are deliberately adding to 73% of the public, so some public drinking water in America, 73%, a substance for which there is no threshold, no scientific threshold has been established for the, for, for the protecting children's brains for all those people drinking fluoridated water. This is, think about it, this is what I would call the greatest public health scandal that there's ever been. I mean, you could argue that vaccination, some aspects of vaccination, especially when they were using uh, organic mercury as a preservative, that was a huge public health scandal, huge. And Bobby Kennedy was absolutely correct in writing a book about thimerosal, which is organic mercury, was being deliberately added to children's vaccines, which were being injected into a baby's bloodstream at one day of age. And they were getting doses equivalent to the level which in fish would have been 100 times the safe level, according to the EPA, for ingestion. Because think of that. Uh, this is such an astounding fact. Uh, and I digress. But I'm talking about public health scandals now. You had a point where if you looked at the total dose of organic mercury a baby was getting from the schedule of vaccines, in those days, this is in the 2000s, early 2000s. If you added it up, a newborn baby, a baby, an infant, was getting a hundred times more organic mercury than was considered safe to be consumed, ingested by a pregnant woman. So the EPA is saying a pregnant woman should not should consume. 100 times less than this. This is all based upon levels in fish. You don't want a woman, a pregnant woman consuming this because they're frightened of it impacting the developing brain. And we have an, the health, another health agency allowing up to 100 times this mercury being injected, injected directly into the bloodstream of newborn babies. That's a public really health unbelievable. That's a public health scandal. Now, the second public health scandal we are living through is for the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, with these top-notch, top-notch scientific studies from several countries, the best conduct conducted studies to date, funded by government agencies, showing the lowering of IQ and showing that this is occurring at the levels at which we fluoridate, to allow this practice to continue on the one hand, and even, even, and we begged, we begged the bloody CDC. We had Zoom meetings with the CDC, the, 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 one of the Karen Hacker, Dr. Karen Hacker. We got those top scientists to go on Zoom and 30 minutes talk about their studies. And I said, they, would, they had no questions for our experts. They said nothing. We're only here to listen. And I said, at least, Dr. Hacker, can you not warn pregnant women that they should not be drinking fluoridated water? Nothing. Nothing. And the public is expected to believe these people. They should be in prison. That's, that's criminal negligence. It's certainly professional negligence. A professional should not be in a position of protect, protecting the public if given this kind of information, they do nothing. The hottest places in hell are reserved for people like this. They do nothing when presented with scientific data. To your point, the data is there. If you yes. go and look for it, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, po I'll post a lot of the links in the description here so people can do their own homework um, and find yes. the data. And I, I think, you know, we did the whole kind of reason we did this interview with you is number one, of course, because you're, you're one of the leading thought leaders and researchers on this topic for, you know, 30 years now. And number two, because we had started to get a lot of inbound questions from our community and viewers and readers 
that it was noticeably picking up. And so th- we put out a survey and the survey results, which were statistically significant, only 4%, the, the question was just fluoride in your drinking water. What's your opinion? Do you want it? Don't you want it? Or do you want more information? Three choices. Only 4%, 4% of people said, I'm okay with fluoride in my drinking water. So it's pretty clear people are waking up to this or hungry for more information and hungry for the truth. And, yep. you know, you provided a ton of excellent data that, that is scientifically based. And like I said, I'll post a lot of it in the description below so people can go and track it down and see for themselves if they want. And, yep. but using that data, I think, you know, it's becoming more and more clear to people that they don't want this in their drinking water. They don't want to be drinking it. They don't want to be ingesting it, any amount of it. And one of the questions that we got from our viewers in preparation for this, um, one of the more frequent questions was, okay, so this affects two thirds of the people in the United States. Fluoridation is an extremely common practice in municipal water treatment plants. So, how do we protect ourselves from fluoride? If we don't want to be exposed to it, how do we protect ourselves? So number one, how do we know if our drinking water has fluoride and then how much fluoride is in our water? So specifically, do we have it? If we do, how much is in our water? And then the second part to that is, okay, we, we either have looked and know that we have fluoride in our drinking water or we just want to treat and get to remove it what are the best filter technologies or types for people to remove it if they know they have fluoride or have tested their water and know that they have fluoride in it what should they be doing well there's lots of answers to that question number one um uh the irony there's a huge irony in all this The single strongest argument that's been there for over 70 years, Eric, about fluoridation of water is that no government has the right to do it. No government has the right to force medication on people without their informed consent. That's always been the strongest argument. And when I got involved in this issue in 1996, I was convinced that this was ethically Um, wrong. It just so happens that being a scientist, I tended to follow the scientific arguments, and we've been able to prove now with science that it is not safe and that it's very ineffective. This is not a good policy on a scientific level. But don't forget, the number one argument is that no government has the right to do this. When a community fluoridates its water, it's doing to everybody what an individual doctor can do to no one. You can't, a doctor can't force a patient to take a medication. He can advise, she can advise the patient to take the medication, but the patient has to make up their own mind, hopefully based upon a good set of information. The doctor is there to provide that, that information best he or she can. So it's a bad practice. However you look at it, it's a bad, 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 bad practice. Anyway, now, as far as Avoiding fluoridation. Well, first of all, there are things that you can avoid which are not being forced upon you. You do not have to use fluoridated toothpaste if you don't want fluoride. Um, So that's you can avoid fluoridated toothpaste. There's non-fluoride toothpaste available. Number two, there are sources of fluoride um, that you can avoid. If you are medium income, Try to eat organic. Try to avoid food with pesticide residues on it because a lot of those pesticides are fluoridated. So avoid if you can get organic, but not everybody can afford it. Next, avoid mechanically deboned meat because fluoride goes accumulates in the bones of animals, the bones of chicken, the bones of beef, the bo- cows and sheep and uh, uh, Avoid mechanically deboned meat because if little chips of bone will contain, when you swallow those little chips, will contain a thousand parts per million of fluoride. Then there's 
there are natural foods which contain fluoride. The tea drink, unfortunately, both black and green tea, do very well in, in high fluoride soils in Japan, in China, India, and elsewhere. So a heavy tea drinker can get a lot of fluoride. Particularly be aware of iced tea in summer months. In, in the summer months, people will drink a lot of iced tea. It's delicious. You put the lemon in, you put the sugar in, and you can drink a gallon of that. And people have come down in the United States, believe it or not, with skeletal fluorosis, crippling skeletal fluorosis, uh, drinking a lot of iced tea. So the, as far as fluoridated water is concerned, the most important thing is that once you've convinced yourself I'm not a lunatic and I've given you the best science there is on this subject, then try to get it out of your local community. Raise it with your council. Get like-minded friends together and go to the council. And don't be frightened of saying, I'm not a scientist, but I really resent. I really resent you as a government forcing me to drink this without my approval. I do not approve uh, giving this drinking water to me. And don't tell me I can go out and buy bottled water because I'm on low income and I can't afford bottled water. And besides, I'm so poor, I, well, I'm, I, I, I don't have a car. I can't carry all these bottles, bottles home. Now, if you are in so that's what you got to do. You got to win this politically, get it out of the water. And I can, can't tell you how exciting it was for us in Canton, New York, where I lived. We got it out of the water. Uh, I think it was in 2007, after about, no, it was 2003. So waking up one morning and then going to the tap and not having fluoridated water, it was such a sense of freedom, freedom at last. We, we don't have to drink this crap. Um, now, there, the cheap water filters, the aqua, aqua filters, whatever it's called, are activated charcoal. Those charcoal filters will remove some nasties like organochlorines, chlorine, etc. But they don't remove uh, the fluoride, so they're no good. The the those filters. Um, Reverse osmosis is a system that does remove fluoride, but it removes everything else as well. So if you use that strategy of reverse osmosis, for goodness sake, go to a health store and get the nutrients that you're uh, now not getting from the water, magnesium, calcium, etc. And then a good health store will know exactly what you need, a little packet of stuff, and you just add a spoonful of that to, you, to your water. Um, now, what we do, we're lucky enough to have a spring near us. The water has been tested. It doesn't have any fluoride in it or very, very little. So we get large containers and we drive over there. And we fill these containers up with, with spring water. And that's what we use. So check to see. It, it, they're on the internet, put in the name of your town and say nearest spring water, nearest spring water. Uh, and you might be lucky and find that you live near a natural spring with low fluoride. Then next, next in order of um, feasibility is see if you have a local water company that sells spring water, bottled water, but Get the test results. What are the what are what are you in the water? And we've done that too. In fact, I should be honest. Um, we have two. We pay to get some bottled water delivered to us, which we know is good water. It's been sourced well. And they've got the test results, no fluoride. So we well, but we have to pay quite a bit of money for that. So we use the spring water um, for cooking. There is an issue, possibly a bacteria in this local spring, um, which is near housing. So we use that where for coffee and tea, where we can boil it, get rid of any bacteria and for cooking. And we use the paid supplied water uh, from the bottler for the other thing. So again, um, if you're gonna spend money on this, make sure that you get a good test results from the company that's selling you this equipment. Um, 
Now, one of the things that we experienced the Florida Action Network, we had a, a very nice company say to us, we would like to help you. Um, we would like to give you so many um, filtered, they had a, a bottle system. They said it removes fluoride. And so we said, fine, we will, we will have it tested. So we had it tested. We actually bought uh, meters to test it. And what we found was, yes, indeed, the first flow of water through this filter removed 90% or more of the fluoride. But within subsequent washes by about, you'd filled this thing about 10 times, its removal capacity had really gone down to about 10%. So you have to be extremely careful. <coughs> and um, so I hope there's some answers for you there, but the best thing is to stop this ridiculous practice. And the only safe dose of fluoride mm -hmm. is zero. And, and the, um, the most important thing is pregnant women, please, please, pregnant woman, please, if you possibly can, breastfeed your baby breastfeed your baby don't bottle feed your baby and if you have to bottle feed your baby please don't use fluoridated tap water <laughs> and for pregnant women please during pregnancy avoid fluoridated toothpaste and avoid <coughs> fluoridated water because every sip of fluoride you get goes straight to the fetus for people that want to get involved with um with this cause lo at the local level in their community, or they have follow-up questions for you or for the Fluoride Action Network, what's the what's the best way for them to get involved or to be in touch with you or FAN uh, with any follow-up questions? Yes, the Fluoride Action Network is, is a mine of information. We've got a huge, huge um, database, huge database on every fluoride's impact on every tissue in the Body. I've only talked about the brain, but there's the thyroid gland, the bones, and all kinds of things. So there's a huge database there, very reliable, science-based information, a very good team we've set up with great, great videos and, and great new newsletters and so on. Stuart Cooper is the new director. Jay, Jay um, Saunders is the uh, video man and outreach a uh, lot of good information there. I wrote a book about this with two other authors. Uh, sadly, one of them has now died, and another one is seriously ill. So I'm sort of the last author standing, if you if you will. It's called the the case against fluoride. There's never been a scientific um, critique of that book, uh, a valid scientific critique, uh, and yet the other side gets away claiming that we're you know it really gets me. You get them saying that the people opposed to fluoridation are scientific nitwits. You, here I am, a professor of chemistry. I joined with two other professors, professor of biology, professor of physics, professor of chemistry. The three of us write this book. They, can, they cannot respond to this book in writing. They won't debate us in public. And yet they still get away with this nonsense that they represent the science and that we're crazy. But anyway, that book is called The Case Against Fluoride. It's available from the publisher Chelsea Green, um, 2010. We desperately need an update. But I would say get the book to give you everything else on the science. That will get you up to speed on most of the science. And then use our website to get yourself up with the neurotoxicity, much of which have been published since 2010. And there's one more source, which I think is invaluable, is read the book, The Fluoride Deception by Christopher Bryson, former BBC producer and reporter, took 10 years to write this book. And he showed the, the intertwining of the, the dental arguments for fluoridation and the industrial lobby working for fluoridation, public health working with the industry back in the 40s and 50s, largely, largely because industry was scared stiff of lawsuits from workers who they had exposed to fluoride in their in the case of the aluminum industry in the pot lines and other industries and the day-to-day -day handling of fluoride. They were scared stiff. They knew how toxic this substance was and they felt that somehow water fluoridation would divert the public from 
air pollution from fluoride from industrial plants. And again, give lawyers, et cetera, and public relations people this little simplistic argument. They would say, why are you worried about fluoride from aluminum processing or phosphate processing or metal works, steel works, et cetera, or brick works, if in fact, the government deliberately puts it into the drinking water. It can't be bad for you, can it? If all these wonderful health agencies around the fluoridated world are putting it in your drinking water. Um, so uh, read the book, The Fluoride Deception. You, you, would, you would be amazed again. The, there's enough to amaze us sexually on every, every front. The, 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 one of our problems, one of the problems is there's so many arguments against fluoridation. Most people don't know where to start. And you just get, there's a certain point, you, you're numbed. You're numbed. Yeah, I mean, a pretty extreme position. I would go to, if the world, or if our country, if the top scientists and the top media and the top government believes that this is a sensible, serious practice, I don't think I really want to live here anymore. Dr. Paul Connett, thank you so much for all of your wisdom um, and sharing all this information that you've taken an entire career to put together and provide with us in this wide ranging interview. And I know it's answered a lot of questions for people that were hungry for, for, for knowledge on the topic of fluoride and water. So thank you so much. And, um, and we'll be in touch. Well, thank you, Eric. Again, I'd like to reiterate, it's such a pleasure and probably the reason I've spoken so much, it's such a pleasure to be interviewed by someone like yourself who's done your homework and you are able to come up with the absolutely right questions to ask someone like myself. Thank you.